Okay, well, welcome everyone in the Sastra community. I'm super excited to have Bernadette Nixon, the CEO of Algolia here. We're gonna have a, a fun conversation on a bunch of levels. Um, Algolia has been part of Sastra since the very beginning. I was lucky enough to lead their first seed round when I think it was six people, um, one in the US, and we've had someone from Algolia participate in every Sastra event uh, for, for years. And then it's exciting to have Bernadette here come as the CEO as the company pushes through 100 million and then a billion in revenue. And even more interesting, she joined, we're all distributed, to, we're all running distributed teams today, but Bernadette's super interesting because she agreed to join just before COVID hit um, and probably was getting her boxes packed and ready to move into her office. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and you've met, you've met like four people in the company when you joined, is that right? I, I, I have met two Algolians so far. That is only, it. Is that really only two, huh? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> we are very <laughs> distributed right now. <laughs> yeah, so we're, two, we're 200 days in this, but what did you have to change? What did you have to change that was different than when you took the jobs? Well, I guess the good thing is that I've been remote for 10 years. So yeah. I guess that was a good background going into this, quite honestly. So I didn't have to change a huge amount, but it did have to, um, I had to edit some of the approach. So, you know, Frankly, frankly, COVID or all of us being remote as we were when I joined, it was a bit of a leveling of the playing field, which was interesting because yeah. ordinarily I'd have joined, I'd have been in San Francisco in person and you know, we've got a large population, as you know, overseas in, in France and the UK, you know, and they would have, you know, felt a little bit like kind of left out of the, of the fun and the excitement. So it was actually being, you know, I was in my office here at home as I am today um, and it was a great sort of, it leveled the playing field. Everybody felt that they were on the, you know, the same, uh, the same level in terms of getting to know me and, and vice versa. So I've always done listening tours when I've started a, a new position, um, yeah. normally are in person, but I do one or two usually that are virtual. Obviously I had to make it all virtual this time. So made it smaller groups and did more of them for longer. So for the first six weeks, I was probably doing three listening, um, uh, list, part of the three meetings on the listening tour, uh, three times a week for probably my first six weeks. And then also started layering in skip levels to get to know people, you know, half an hour here and there. And 20 minutes of that could be nothing to do with Algolia because yeah. I was trying to simulate, you know, I'd have these conversations if I was bumping into people, bumping into them in the kitchen, making a coffee. You know, how do you simulate that? You have to be, I think, more intentional about that sort of stuff. Yeah, the listening tour is interesting. Um, a lot, one of the many things I didn't get at first and now I realize is so important, right? How much time do you give yourself as a, as a new CEO? How long, how much can you do that? And how long do you get to be the new person? You know, years ago, I remember my manager saying to me at the end of my second week, okay, now the honeymoon's over. So what are you going to do? <laughs> two weeks. Two weeks <laughs> and it's yours. <laughs> yeah. So it's not quite two weeks, but I, I think different things work at a different pace. And yeah. part of what I say to even new execs that I bring on board, and I've just brought three on board, you know, because they want to learn, they want to listen, they don't want to um, make any decisions too soon based upon, you know, you know, first impressions or not a complete picture. And yep. I say to them, when you know, you know, and therefore move and the things that you're not quite sure about, then you need to wait till you are sure about them. So I don't think there's one speed or it's not the same across all aspects of the business. I think some things you can move pretty quickly on. And I think others you've got to really, really understand before you make your move. Have you, um, and I want to talk about some, some, some business stuff next, but that, how, how different it was is interesting. Have you found that um, because it's flatter in the distributed world that certain, some folks have risen up in the leadership that might not have when, uh, when they weren't in headquarters? Yes, actually. So there was, um, there's um, an individual that was part of the pre-sales team that is now running a solutions group for us. And, um, you know, she's young in her career but she's doing fabulous stuff. And yeah, yeah. would she have gotten that exposure? Otherwise, I don't know. Um, but she's doing an amazing job. So it's great to see things like that for sure. Yeah, I found that everyone, there used to be someone that was at the bottom corner of the Zoom. <laughs> but now it's level and one of those folks just becomes a star, right? And they just, they couldn't have in the prior environment, right? 
Um, are you guys going to, I mean, Algole has a fabulous office in Paris uh, or it did, and it has roots in SF. Will you guys go back to the office? Have you figured this out? Um, what's the world going to look like uh, in 2022? Sure. Well, I mean, you know, you've got, you know, leases, depends how long your leases are. So well, you are leases. Yeah. yeah. So you've typically got that for a fixed period of time, but I think the office, we will definitely still keep office locations, but they will look very different. I mean, my yeah. vision for that is they will look like, they'll look more like, cafes than they will, you know, rows and rows of cubes. Um, so I think they'll look very different. And for us, I think they'll look a, a little bit, I want to try and get a little funky with some of the offices because we need to collaborate, not just in that location, but we'll need to, you know, if you're in Paris, you'll need to dial somebody in from, from San Francisco and vice versa. And how do you do that in a collaborative space without having to be locked in a conference room, you know, all day. So I'm, know we're gonna we're gonna get creative with uh with some of the office space yeah um and then just one curious question I, as i've talked because you're you've been a pretty 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 experienced manager a lot of folks have said in the distributed world you know the seasoned folks benefit from it right we can work from home it's quiet the the engineers that have been at Algoli for several years are the folks with maybe five or ten years of experience but training new folks is harder and many folks that don't have the roots. Have you, have you changed anything? Have you learned anything about how to onboard folks in these times? Because I'm guessing 20% of Algole has never been to the office either at this point, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because we've yeah. been hired pretty, pretty aggressively. Um, I think it requires, we've got a pretty good onboarding process where it's got to be lots of um, different touch points and you've got to be very it can't all be on the hiring manager. There's got to be a team that supports them really from HR and different parts of the organization. And you can yeah. do it still and be pretty lean. Um, but I think you have to get fairly creative. Got it. So let's talk about, I just, you just announced you brought on a whole bunch of seasoned executives, some of whom you worked before, a CRO, a CCO. And I guess I get, there's so many C's, a chief business development officer. We can make up any acronyms we want, right? Is the next phase, right? Crossing a yes. hundred million to a billion. So what, um, what did you look for in executives at this phase? Like, I, cause I, we were chatting before we went live, Algolia has a brand, but not everyone that's going to listen to this has heard of Algolia. Mm -hmm. um, but especially if you're developer focused or have built software for a while and deployed search there's a decent chance you've heard of Algoli at this point, but it's no, it's, we're not at the uh, Microsoft or Adobe level of right. brand, not, not, not even, not even a Twilio or, or, or someone like that. Right. So who do you need at this next phase to like, to get to nine figures and beyond revenue? What does the makeup look like? How agile versus how senior, what, what were you looking for for these hires? Yeah, it's interesting. So for the CRO role, I was looking for somebody who was pretty seasoned, but I didn't want, you know, a typical enterprise. Uh, we do sell into the enterprise, but I didn't want a typical enterprise sales leader. I needed somebody that was really good at pattern matching, really good at getting to repeatability, a high velocity sale, and then yeah. also could span up into the enterprise as well. So I was looking for definitely somebody who had more of a science than an art approach to the role. Um, and somebody who was, you know, pretty maniacal about uh, understanding our ideal customer profile, really living and, and working collaboratively with the CMO on the pipeline and yep. really making sure that we had focus because we're a platform and there's probably many companies out there that are platform companies. I've done nothing but platforms for the last 10 years. And what I can tell you is it's extremely hard ramping salespeople to sell a platform because it can be many things to many people. Therefore, yes. you have a use case based approach where you can kind of get it to be cookie cutter and you can train people on, you know, specific plays that you can launch into market. So I was looking for somebody who had that experience, understood that was and had a track record of delivering in a high velocity model and that could flex into the enterprise for me. Now let, that's a, that, let's just, Dig in that a little bit. Your CRO, she last came from Dropbox for Business. Is that right? Or Dropbox Enterprise? Do I have that right? Yep. Yeah. So Dropbox is interesting, although different in that it has a long tail like Algolia, lo uh, longer than Algolia, right? Everyone's used Dropbox. How many customers does Algolia have? 9,700 right now. Okay. So 10,000. And how many, so that we know, I don't know how many folks have used Algolia or how many that have the longest tail, including free and folks. It, it's probably 10x that or something, isn't it? Oh, um, yes, it's close to that. If you look at developers on the platform, you know, yeah. eyeballs on open source docs, probably close to that. Yes. So, but 
high velocity to me says, um, high velocity gets me from 10,000 to 20,000 to 50,000 to 100,000, right? But sometimes there's a trade-off in that you don't, you're not able to spend as much time on closing that, that great seven-figure deal, right? Uh, what is the trade-off there? Because you have, your, your CRO can do everything, but she or he can't be perfect at everything, right? Everyone has, a, has, a, has their top insertion point. So why did you pick? How do you know when you have 10,000 customers which piece of the pie to make your number one criterion? I think you've got to analyze your customer base. So, I mean, yes. we analyzed that 10,000 customers. We understood how many of those were field managed. We understood yes. um, how many were SMB, mid-market and enterprise. And then we made an assessment as to, you know, where are in the, in the short and medium term, where was our biggest opportunity and then longer term. And that yep. made me want to go for somebody who most recently had got the high velocity, but I didn't want to go for exclusively somebody who had that skill set. I wanted somebody who had the enterprise too, because I didn't want to have to switch them out in 12 months time. Yeah, that gets hard, right? Um, or you have to segment it, right? You have to have two yep. CROs or two senior vice president of sales, and that's tough to manage two fiefdoms at the same time, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and um, uh, cool. And then you hired a chief customer officer to do it. When you, so now you're getting a chance to do it again, right? You've been a leader, you've been a sales leader, you've been a CEO, CEO. now it's 2021. Yep. So are you thinking any differently about how customer success and sales, CRO and CCO should work together in these days and uh, with new learnings? Is any, any fresh learnings or new insights you wanna, you wanna deploy here? Yeah, I mean, for many years, as you know, because you're right, I came up through the ranks on the go to market side. And for many years, I did that dual role of CRO and CCO. Yeah. I chose to break it out. And that's how Algolia had it as well when I came. But I chose to break it out because for a SaaS company, the customer success function is just so critical. And I wanted to have somebody that represented that's all they did. They eat, slept and breathed our customer experience and customer journey. I wanted them to have a seat at the table so that when we're having those discussions about where we take the company and, and what we do next, that that voice came out loud and clear and wasn't subjugated under anybody else. Yep. And now, and when, you know, I don't know the exact numbers today and maybe, maybe I'll go is getting too big to disclose it, but as a company that has a lot of developer centric roots, accounts do flex and they grow a lot over time. Right. And some, some accounts you, you'll drop in and it'll be a massive website with massive search needs and you'll close a big deal, but there's plenty of accounts that could start at a few hundred dollars a month, a thousand dollars a month and grow into big accounts. Um, when it, when the growth is a lot like a Twilio or Algolia for accounts, do you think about the line between sales and success differently? Do you think about the handoff? Do you think about compensation plans differently? Like, how do you handle this when there's a lot of growth, a lot of it which could be automated, right? A lot of which could be automated and not require sales. Yeah, so we have a self-service business as well. Um, and that's something that we're, we're starting to look at and see how we fine tune. So over yes. time, one of the questions that I have is when you start to look at our SMB sector, could that SMB sector actually be served by the self-service engine? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a so the, the, that's a interest, like, it's an interesting question of when you have an SMB, could, could you, there's obviously an appeal to have it self-service, right? require less people, forces you to do more work on onboarding and automation than you might yep. otherwise would, right? Looks good on, a, on an org chart, but sometimes I worry that maybe the, the idea is to put more people into it because maybe they get ignored when what if you put 50 people on it? Let's say, so I don't know, and maybe we don't want to say, but let's say self-service today is 10% of Algolia's revenue. Maybe it was 30% before. Usually it declines with companies like Algolia, right? Because the big accounts, you know, box is 1% today. It used to be 30%, right? So there's a, but what if that 10% could be 15% if you put 30 people on it? It's an interesting, different way to think about it. Um, but anyhow, automation is what you're, is what you're thinking about. Um, it does make yeah. the product better, right? It does. And we just hired a, a VP of growth as well. So, you know, we're looking to, uh, we're looking to just, you know, do some experimentation and, and, and get some learnings in that space. So let's do one more on sales. And then I want to talk about some other things at Algolia, but maybe this is true of a lot of products, but certainly in the early days when I watched Algolia, a challenge is that search 
search is a core part of basically every web product, right? And we'll talk, I want to talk a little bit about e-commerce and SaaS and media because certain segments search is more important, right? In e-commerce, if you can find something faster or better, the ROI is there. Other categories are less ROI focused, but we can't find a single website where search is not only important, but usually at the top, right? You go into the nav, what's at the top? So, but, but it's not something that is always thought about every week because a decision might be made every few years, every four to five years, you might build a product, refresh a product, right? So how do you, and a lot of us are that way, right? How do you get more top of mind? How do you get customers and prospects to accelerate a buying decision or a deployment decision or a switching decision? How do you, have you thought more about how to get more velocity in decision-making in, in search? Yeah, I mean, so you're right. If somebody's doing a redesign or a, a replatforming, it's an obvious yeah. time to think about search. But there are, I would say, um, you know, not all search on every website is created equal insofar as search on an e-commerce site or yes. a media site that is um, selling subscriptions is, you know, there's a, such an intrinsic value between the search and the conversion that those types of organizations are not just looking at it when they replatform because they're looking at it as how do I optimize my search by presenting the right kind of personalized results to the people that come to my uh, to my site and are searching for stuff. So they are thinking about it on a more continuous basis. Yeah. And so we try to provide tools to be top of mind as they're going through that journey. For example, you can go to algolia.com today and you can on scroll down on the home page, you can find the search grader. And that is nothing to do with Algolia. It is a tool that anybody with a, a website, be it an e-commerce or a regular experience website, you can check out, it, you can go through an assessment and it will assess what your search capability is like on your existing um, site. So you have to try and get creative, I think, to find ways to become relevant in between those obvious milestones where they're going to look at it. Now, and now, and you might have to get me up to speed on where Algolia is in 2020, but Al Algolia is an API that yep. is deployed by developers and its mm -hmm. number one segment is e-commerce. And in e-commerce, right. you have marketers that want ROI lift, right? They want yeah. increased conversions. So you're marketing and selling to both marketers and developers, which are pretty far apart on the, on the continuum and spectrum. H how do you do both and how does that change at the next phase, right? As your customer mix and buyers change? Yeah, and I think we've gone through some of that change already. So in the earlier days, we only focused on developers. Hyper and then develop. I th Every developer event, Algole was there, right? Yeah, Very exactly. developer focused, right? Then I think we pivoted. I think we pivoted to the line of business persona um, and perhaps a little too much. So too to much. me, yeah. the bread and butter is focusing on your core persona, which for us is the definitely the developer persona. But then you've got to understand who your other personas are and really target them directly. So for us, it's actually category managers uh, in e-commerce or, or even media. And it would be product managers in a SaaS company um, or even in a media company when they're producing a product and they want search to be embedded in it. It's often the product manager or the category manager. So you got to get specific. You can't be all things to all people. you got to get yep. specific. So who, and in, 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 uh, it was interesting to me meeting the, the, the team in the very beginning days because the company was focused on inbound and outbound, right? Targeting buyers. So when you have those personas, who are you from an outbound perspective and sales perspective, who, you, who do you target today? Who are you trying to get into, get, get, get exposure to and get into the hands of? Um, it, it really is those category owners. If it's a brand, it's a brand owner or okay. it's a product manager in a SaaS company. So that um, might be someone mid-level on an org chart, right? It might not be the CMO, right? Or this, or the chief product, mid-level. And mm -hmm. then you're trying to get them to go, to go knock on the Zoom. It used to be knock on the cube or the door. You're trying to get them to knock on the Zoom of the developer and getting them to, to deploy it into a, 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 a next week and check out the product. Or how does that flow go today? Yeah, it can go either way in actual fact. So, you know, there's a developer relations component, making sure that we're engaging with the developer community. And that's an area yep. that we're investing in at the moment. So we often get the pull, frankly, from the developer that then introduces us to the business person. Still and today, often, still at scale, you're getting developer to, to yep. knock on the door. But if the yep. developer isn't thinking about ROI in e-commerce, or are they thinking about conversions in ROI? They, I think they are... 
in e-commerce companies, yes, they are. But it's they're all you talk about, right? Well, they're also thinking about their time. I mean, if COVID has taught us nothing, it's that you have to be agile. You have to be nimble. If you yes. don't, you know, it's got catastrophic consequences for the business. So therefore, you know, they're looking at it and they're looking at their, how do they differentiate? They can't just do that with using standard UI layers out there from a, a DXP or an e-commerce engine. They've got to take control of that personalization, that UX level. And yeah. so then they're looking for the right tools to plug in. And so they're pretty, you know, they're almost two in a pod, you know, with, um, with the business person these days. Yeah, it's true. Um, let's chat a little bit about segments because when you and I caught up earlier, it was interesting, at least somewhat interesting. Um, Algolia is a search as a service product. It has been, it's horizontal. It could be used anywhere, but yeah. e-commerce since the early days took off because the ROI was there, right? Increased conversions through search that is 10 times faster and five times more accurate. Even if you increase conversions modestly, the, the out, the outcome could be huge, right? For an e-commerce. So that, that became number one, even within an early team that was not e-commerce <laughs> experts. Right. And then, and then I, I, I was always interested in the SaaS side, but media was number two and then COVID changed things, right? So e-commerce still got a boost. So e-commerce number one, but, but SaaS became your largest, second largest category of customers, right? How did that, how many SaaS companies are there? And how, what does that mean? And how can they be your second largest category today? You know, um, I think some of that wave started prior to COVID, but I think yeah. it certainly did accelerate as well. I mean, we've got, you know, companies like Weight Watchers. If you're logging your food in the Weight Watchers app, that's Algolia powering it because yep. of the, you know, the speed and the accuracy and the relevance of what, what we expose to you. So I think it comes back to being nimble. You know, a lot of companies are looking at putting new products out in the market. They're looking at competing and they don't want to, you know, they want differentiation, but they don't want to build it all from scratch. So therefore they look to us, for example, to give them that boost in terms of, you know, how long does it take them from starting with us to being in production and in market? And that's yep. part of the value that we offer to the developer. We shrink that window. Yep. And when, and just when you have two segments of customers like e-commerce and SaaS that are very different. So mm -hmm. one is focused on maximizing ROI and conversions, right? And the other, on an average SaaS company, you want to get to data quickly and you want to have a sort of a stripe-like elegance of deployment, but the ROI is different, right? The ROI is different and, and it's, it's critical to find data. In, in SaaS, we want to find our data, right? We want to structure or really mm -hmm. semi-structure unstructured data. That's what search does, right? I've got terabytes of unstructured data, but how do you, how do you market two different ROIs? Is it, is it as simple as landing page? Do you have two different sales teams? Do you specialize your sales teams in the different verticals? Or, Cause it's a different ROI and different approach. How do you, how do you do that in two different verticals like this? Yeah, you, well, you've got some choices to make, some of which yeah. have you know, financial implications, but at a bare minimum, you've got to approach them as two different plays that you're launching. And yeah. you have to have you know, separate you know, ideal customer profiles. You've got to have separate ways that you train your salespeople yep. uh, on how to be successful. How do you qualify? How, what's the value they're going to be interested in? What is the, what's the pitch deck? It will be very different for both of those segments. The demos will be very different for both of those segments. They are. So how yeah. long, how can you have the sales, same sales team do this forever? How early do you want to specialize, do you think? So we have had up until this point, the same sales team do everything. And yep. we'll actually launch an experiment um, next year where we have um, a small OEM, for example, sales team um, specifically focused on those app, that the SaaS companies. Got it. So starting now, right? You'll see. Yeah. So we'll find out if it's if it was late or early when we check in when we check in next year, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Two or two other things I want to make sure we we touch on before we run out of time. We can hit anything else you want. But um, one that I'm really bad at, um, but learning about more is culture, because um, I I still always wonder what culture is. Um, but Algolia is interesting because it's it's it it's really we're all distributed now, but it's a it's a company with roots on very different con 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 continents and a very French piece. Um, what have you learned? Are, are, are our cultures different? How do we blend cultures? Are people different? I, I like to think of everyone as the same and it's a meritocracy and, and be neutral, but it, it's not true, right? There are, there are differences. So what if, how do you blend companies on different continents and different cultures? Yeah, and I, I guess I've been lucky because in my last three roles, they've been yeah. with companies that are very similar to Algolia and they've had 
two big centers of presence on different continents here in, yes. in Western Europe. Um, you know, I used to live in uh, Switzerland and, and France, so I speak French and I've lived in, you know, lived in continental Europe. So I do think that helps me sort of bridge a little. But I think it comes down to two things for me. You know, you said, what is culture? Culture, I think, can be nebulous, but you can impact culture and it's, you can impact it every single day and every single person in the company can impact it by the decisions and the actions that they take and all the conglomeration of all of that really makes up the culture. So I like to get it out of the stratosphere and down into the sort of practical for me, because I struggled with it for many years too. But yeah. when I look at it here at Algolia, I think, there's two things that are important. One, I think you have to educate people on the fact that not everybody has the same perspective and here's why. So I think there's a, there's a sharing that you've got to take the time to do, uh, which in the moment can sometimes be challenging because you want to get to the end of that task, but you have to take a step back sometimes and, and understand. Um, and I think the second thing is that you know, there's been a lot of focus in the press and the media all around differences right now. And, you know, diversity, inclusion and belonging is at the top of everybody's minds at the moment. To me, I like to see the differences as making us stronger. It doesn't mean to say we'll always all agree. It doesn't mean to say that, um, you know, anybody or any one perspective is better than another. But I like to think about how do we harness our differences to make us better? You know, yep. some could say that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's inconvenient having a nine hour difference um, between San Francisco office and Paris. <laughs> and occasionally it is, trust me. Uh, but, um, but the other side of that is how do you get that time difference to work where you don't have a single point of failure and where it's effectively you are getting, you know, almost 24 hours coverage. Now, I wouldn't say we're there today, but that's yep. the journey that we're on. And I think it's, it's recognizing that people have different perspectives that's okay but the one mission is the same yeah is there anything now that you've joined like uh, you know to put those different perspectives to surface more of them at the company do you have any tips or learnings how to get those out of, i mean how many folks work at algo today 400 500 folks yeah, approaching 400 400 so how do you how do you surface have you tried to surface more of them or how do you do that we have actually a couple, well, I mean, you know, two weeks into my role here, um, you know, George Floyd was killed mm -hmm. and, you know, we started talking about that. So we had different lif listening circles. It was interesting because as we saw, you know, the social unrest that followed all of the, those events, as we saw those sort of traverse the world, you know, we saw some of the um, perspectives of our colleagues in other countries change as, you know, that's really an American problem. Oh, actually, no, hold on. The, those riots are happening here on my doorstep now. That's not just an American problem. So, you know, nobody wants any of that to happen, but it does enable you to have the dialogue. Yep. It's a good insight. Okay. Two last things I want to hit. Um, um, one's very tactical, but it's always interesting to folks is pricing. Um, so you've recently revamped pricing, right? Um, pricing's always, it generally, I think we obsess about it sometimes too much, but Algolia has always been interesting because over time they've always struggled with the breaks, right? The break points between, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, 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 a very, a, a low usage free version, a cheap version for developers to get started, more enterprise in the middle. And the breaks have always been challenging for the company for whatever reasons, right? They've always been challenging to not overprice, not underprice. Um, it's not obvious, right? It's not obvious. Yeah. And so what if, what, what have you changed? And maybe even more importantly, what have you learned about the different ways to price? Sure. So I think one of the learnings is it's really hard when you go all the way from self-service all the way up to the enterprise to have yes. one model that fits all. So one of the things that we changed back in July was we actually went to a usage model so that we didn't have these artificial breaks. We have just two plans and it's usage based. Now you can do pay as you go, just sign up on the website, you know, swipe your credit card, or you can commit. Um, and at higher volumes that involves a sales conversation. But we found that those art, what it did was it removed those artificial sort of jump points. There's a much smoother curve now so that customers feel much more comfortable that they're they're buying into a certain level of usage that is tied to their business outcome 
uh, as opposed to having to have artificial tiers or to even, you know, in the old days, we used to have infrastructure based pricing, which, you know, they liked even less. Yeah. So going for usage, smoothing out that curve has definitely been a big boon for us and it has boosted the self-service business tremendously. Um, I still think it's tricky to get it right all the way from there up to the enterprise with one model. So will we tweak it still? We probably will. But now, now that I get, and, and I wanted to ask a little bit about that, but in my limited experience as a SaaS CEO, but also my limited experience as an SVP in, in a bigger company, mm -hmm. certainty does matter too, right? So there's a certain point where it's not fun. I don't care about the benefits of that when I'm a big, when I, I don't know what the amount of revenue a company has. I want to, I have a budget. I have a yep. budget, Bernadette, and just tell me what it's going to like. And so that's the, the, the artificial breaks. It sounds like they stressed out sales, right? Oh, that's too much. You know, a thousand, two thousand, five thousand is too much, but yes. certainty does matter too, right? So, so that's where, why where, where, does that, where does that change and how do you educate the sales team to get that right? Yeah, so we have a certain volume that you can buy via self-service. And then after yeah. that, we believe that a conversation is better. And that's why we, even though it's usage based, you sign up for a, an amount of usage over a 12 month period so that you do yes. get that budget uncertainty. Have you studied like, I mean, obviously who's figured this out pretty good is AWS. <laughs> I mean, everyone complain. I mean, AWS used to be cheap. I don't, if we've been doing this for a long time, we remember when it was cheap. Now it's very expensive, but it's worth it, right? I don't think yep. we're going to argue it's not worth it. I mean, Algolia is multi-cloud, which we could chat about for the last minutes if you wanted to and what you've learned. But, um, but they've learned to start off variable and then have multi-year contracts, right, as you go bigger, yep. right? And have you, have you studied anything you've learned from other folks here that you've brought into Algolia? Are there other folks that you, that you, that you look at their pricing strategies and want to bring them in? Yeah, we do. We look at Azure, we look at um, AWS, we look at those two in particular, as, as well as a whole host of other um, SaaS companies when we were doing the uh, the pricing analysis. Yeah. And yes, yeah, so we have, you know, I always used to say, you know, AWS, they have, you know, the pay-as-you-go, then they have reserved instances, and then they have their EDPs, which, you know, could be 20 million. So yep. we, we, we basically have the same thing. We have the, you know, swipe your credit card, pay-as-you-go, but then we have uh, what they would call the reserved instance. It's not an instance. It's a reserved number of searches, if you like, you would do with us. That would be our comparable um, for a certain period of time. And yes, if you want to buy it for one year or two years or three years, we'd never go beyond three years. Um, but we would go up to three years and we have programs for all of that. All right. And one last follow up on that. We could spend a whole session on pricing, but I still hear a lot of advice from folks cloud investors, SaaS investors, in particular VCs, that want the most revenue recurring, like and under fixed contracts. And when Twilio IPO'd, a lot of folks were skeptical. Oh, Twilio is going to take a hit. Twilio is going to take a hit because they're concentrated. Well, they were. They lost Uber. And Twilio is going to take a hit because they have a lot of variable revenue, right? Well, what's Twilio today? Forty billion. So, and I don't think their multiple has. But does that matter? Do you think about that as CEO? Do you want? Do you still want as much committed revenue versus variable? Or does this not even matter as long as you hit your number? Um, I do think about it. And in fact, I've spoken to a number of the number of bankers recently that took yes. several um, of the well-known IPOs to those software companies public just recently. And, you know, they have an interesting um, take on it and the usage provided it's consistent and growing and it's not lumpy. They value yes. the usage the same way as they would just a regular subscription. So and that's the insight, right? As long as you see the same retention numbers, right? right? Twilio is like 145% net revenue retention right? growth. You don't have to have the perfect uh, e-sign contracts for every month for the same amount, right? That's the learning. Right. Yep, yeah. exactly. Consistency and consistency up and to the right is, is, you know, is the key learning. Well, ideally, if you have 10,000 customers and high NPS, the consistency should work itself out over time, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, that's yeah. a good insight. Okay, last one, they're related. Um, I just, you've been, you've been in enterprise software and business sovereign cloud software most of your career, right? These yeah. are the best of times, aren't they? <laughs> oh my God, absolutely. <laughs> so is it too good? How long will it last? And related to that, why did you pick Algolia in the best of times? You had a lot of options. So this, this is as good as it gets. Why, why Algolia? And in general, how long, do we have another five years? Do we have 20 years? Is, is this all going to crash on us when we come out of COVID? Like how long will the best of times last? Oh Lord, I wish I had the crystal ball <laughs> for that one. <laughs> I think we all do. Um, so why did I, why did I choose Algolia? Um, it was really, it was, it was 
really because of three main things. I mean, I looked at the, I looked at the market, the target address, addressable market, and it's huge. And yeah. I have experience in search previously from both ends of our competitive spectrum, all the way from open source down to purpose built SaaS packages. And I firmly believe that Algolia's approach to the market being an API um, search as a service solution is 100% the right way to go. So yeah. those were the primary reasons. The other reason was um, I loved the fact that there was a self-service business because I believed it would make our product better. and I wanted to get more exposure in that part, that end of the market. And then finally, I saw the, you know, every company has its growing pains and I felt that I'd seen a good chunk of this movie before and that I could help. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Let's finish on the rest of it. The last one's interesting. Um, you know, when a company goes through phase transitions or growing pains, a great one like Algolia, Sometimes you think you can't recruit somebody great, right? If you hit a bump, but the great people know those bumps, right? And actually they'll, ju they'll jump on those opportunities because they know how to fix them. They've done it before. So if you hit a bump, don't think you can't hire a great VP of sales or VP of marketing or CEO because they, they know, they know when that's an opportunity, don't they? Oh, 100%. Absolutely. <laughs> those, are, those are the, you know, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. And like you said, I mean, you look at the backdrop of the market that we're in right now. And, you know, gosh, I don't know how long this is going to last. But what I would say is you've got to run with it. And you've got to be you've got to be agile yourself to be able to take a hold of things. And I would say, if there are companies out there that are looking at how to um, how to harness this i would say really get serious about your icp your ideal customer profile and go yeah. figure out you know one of the things that i i did at alfresco was we figured out what were the four questions we could ask we got marketing to automate them and based upon that we segmented the target customers we wanted to go after into three buckets digital innovators fast followers and digital dinosaurs we put the dinosaurs in a drawer and we figured on the other two so anything that you can do to streamline and as i was saying before get to that repeatable process to really maximize the opportunity that is there i think that's what everybody should be focusing on and now's the carpe diem right now's the time yeah 100 <laughs> percent all right Brett, this was amazing thank you so much for your time anything anything last thing we didn't hit that you wanted to hit or get out there no, I think it's just, um, you know, I, I'm loving being at Algolia, just the approach that we've got to helping our customers and you layer that on top of fantastic technology and a, a great approach to the market. And it's, it's, a, it's a great time to be at Algolia. We're uh, recruiting heavily. And so I would encourage people to uh, ping us. Ping us, go, jo go join up, go join a pre-IPO winner today. That's yeah, great. Exactly.